morning, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to UISG, to Sister Pat Murray, Sister Carmen, and all the staff for their wonderful invitation. And thank you to GHR and particularly to Kathleen Mahoney. Without their support, we could not have even begun to think about executing such a large and significant study. Let me begin by saying that my colleagues, Dr. Mary Gauthier, Sister Patricia Whitberg, and Sister Tu Do, join us here in spirit. Without their tremendous uh, labor, we would not have been able to cover the territory of the United States. I'm very mindful this morning that the Second Vatican Council called us to use the tools of the social sciences in order to further understand the church's internal life for the sake of its external mission. And so this morning, you will have an experience of hearing about the methods we used to gather the data we were able to collect. And these data are for your purposes now so that you can begin theological reflection and further social analysis for the sake of the mission of religious life in the church and the world. I'm very mindful too of the backdrop of the last three years of our study in the US and the larger backdrop across the world. We were dealing with a, an increasing anti-immigrant sentiment and horrific actions as we collected our data. And we're very mindful that that anti-immigrant sentiment will affect uh, the movement of women and men religious across the borders of nations as we try to do our mission for Christ. So we could go on for hours, but I only have one hour. And so I will go right now to the methods that we used and the data that we collected in large strokes. So this morning is about the forest. It's not about the trees. We're going to talk about the big picture. And then you can move this into your own organizations and your own ministries and see what is applicable to you for further action as we together focus on this very important dimension of religious life in the world. First, this is the first study of its kind in the United States. And now that we have concluded it, we know why no one else ever attempted this before. <laughs> It was a marvelous collaboration between CARA, the Center for Applied Research in the Apostolate at Georgetown University, which is the Catholic Research Center for the United States Church, and uh, Trinity Washington University, where I have the privilege of teaching. And again, it was funded by GHR, and we could not have done it without their very generous gift. As you heard, but it's important that we repeat this, the definition we use was intentionally broad. An international sister in our work is a woman religious who was born outside the US and is now living there in ministry or study or residence. There were two levels of methods. Now, one does not have to be a math major to follow this. So it's important for me to talk about these methods because often we hear reflections that are not grounded in reality. So as I say at home, a perfect example of social analysis is Pope Francis's Laudato Si. He laid out the reality of what the world faces and then he crafted a magnificent theological response and followed it with uh, calls to action. So we'll begin now laying the land of this sociological analysis of what the reality is 
on the ground in the U.S. and in many other places of the world. The first thing we did was contact the 560 U.S.-based institutes of women religious around the U.S. We sent a brief survey and a request for the names of any international sisters in their institute. We also asked them for the names and contact information of any international sisters in their geographic area, so from other congregations. We received a 60% response rate, which was amazing. We received a magnificent response from the LCWR orders, the CMSWR orders, and the monasteries. So we included sisters and nuns in this study. Those surveys identified over 1,600 sisters. And those congregations told us that only 19% of them had no international sisters either uh, within their institutes. So that means over 80% of the institutes in the United States of women has at least one, and more often they have many, international sisters. After we completed that phase, which took months, we then contacted the 194 vicars for religious in the U.S. dioceses. So there are 195 dioceses in the U United States. But one is the military archdiocese, so we contacted 194. Some dioceses have no vicar or delegate for religious. Often that's due to funding issues. In those cases, the survey was sent to either the chancellor or the bishop. There is a wide range of institutional structures across the church in the United States. Some dioceses have very strong uh, diocesan offices, others not so strong. But from that survey, we received again a very very good response rate of 61 percent and those surveys contained another 1800 names and contact information of sisters only 18 dioceses reported having no international sisters so that means uh, the vast majority have at least one and in most cases many now, let me stop here and say, finding international priests is much easier. There have been two studies in the U.S. of international priests. It's easier to find the priests because they are incarnated in dioceses. So master lists exist, and sociologists have to compile a list before we can do anything, before we can systematically find people. So, one of the things that we did uh, was put the two lists together from the leaders of the institutes and from the vicars or delegates, and in doing that, we had the contact information and the names of over 4,000 sisters. In the brief survey to the congregational leaders or the superiors, we asked if they themselves provided any assistance to international sisters. So this is the level now of in institute data. And we found some very interesting findings. Now this is the, 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 the response of the congregational leader or superior. Half of the respondents said they provide housing. And that housing is often in the mother house or large convents. 
Almost half provide spiritual support and education and transportation. About one third provide immigration and legal services. Close to a third provide financial aid for those sisters who are attending school. They provide language or ESL, English as a second language, or accent reduction courses. Some provide stipends and benefits. Some provide employment opportunities for those sisters. Then smaller percentages provide some kind of mentoring or support group, acculturation training, a variety of other responses, and then finally 8% provide an interpreter or a cultural liaison. Now this is important to analyze because later we ask the question of the sisters, what more do they need for their mission? So we see what's being offered and then we'll see what they are identifying as needs on their behalf. For the second stage, we mailed a survey to the 3,500 international sisters identified by the institutes and by the vicars. And we had that survey translated from English into Spanish, French, and Vietnamese. We then distributed an additional 500 surveys through what's called a snowball sample at public presentations where we knew international sisters would be present and we distributed them through other organizations with access to international sisters. From that population we received 1143 surveys from sisters in over 80 countries on six continents, and they come from 257 different religious institutes. So when we have shared these data with social scientists, their first response is amazement. This is really stunning. The breath of this is unlike most other surveys. In addition to the data we received from the surveys, we also conducted all around the United States, east, west, north, south, midwest, a total of 26 focus groups and individual interviews with a, a total of 20, 75 international sisters and we centered those interviews around four basic questions. The experience of arriving in the U.S., challenges they face in living and working there, the contributions they make to religious life and ministry in the U.S., and their advice for future ar arrivals and to those who would welcome them.
So, now we will begin a story that contains many stories. So there are some stereotypes that exist in lots of places about who are these sisters, and we discovered that it is a very complex and beautiful story with all kinds of potential for the sake of our mission. So let's begin with the question, who are they? When we asked them their continent of origin, when we look at the respondents to our survey, the 1100 plus, one third are from Asia. Almost a third are from Europe. 17% are from North America. And we are using Vatican categories of analysis. So North America is Canada and Mexico. And obviously we leave out the United States. 10% are from Africa. 10% from Central and South America, and 2% from Oceania. Now, when we write the book, we will put these kinds of data against the backdrop of migration patterns in the U.S. and across the world. And we have very rich data from the Pew Research Center on this. So, for instance, Up until the year 2009, the largest sending areas in recent years to the U.S. were from Mexico and Latin America. Since 2009, the largest continent sending immigrants in general to the U.S. is Asia. So as we move through our sister's data, we'll also be weaving in larger data about immigration to the U.S. and immigration patterns around the world. A, a word about Europe. Some of those Europeans are from Western Europe, some from Central, some from Eastern, some have been in the U.S. a long time, some are recent arrivals. We asked about pathways to the U.S. Now these are categories we share with you so that you can do your own analysis of your local circumstances. Over a third of the sisters said they entered religious life in their congregation outside the U.S., then they were sent to the U.S. for ministry. That's the largest category. 28% said they came to the U.S. prior to entering religious life. 13% said they entered outside the U.S., then were sent for study. 10% said they entered outside the U.S. and then were sent to the U.S. for part of their religious formation. 6% said they transferred to U a U.S. province of their international congregation from another province outside the U.S. 2% said, I transferred to my congregation in the U.S. from another congregation altogether outside the U.S. And finally, 2% said, I came to the U.S. to enter religious life in the U.S. And we have interviewed sisters from all of those categories. In the last category, 
most of those sisters found their order on the internet. Again, more categories. What they said their reason was for coming to the U.S. The largest percentage said they were sent here by their superior for a particular ministry. 15% said a priest or a bishop requested sisters from my congregation or ministry. 13% said my superior sent me here to study. Smaller percentages said they were sent here for formation. 9% came with their family. That percentage came as children, as teenagers, or as young adults. 8% were invited by a friend or family member. Another percentage came to enter religious life, and a small percentage for other reasons. Now, what other characteristics are of interest to us? Their average age is 58. That's about 20 years younger than the average age of US born sisters. Nine and ten, nine out of ten are active. On average, they entered religious life at the age of 23, and they entered the U.S. at the age of 30. A very important piece for the analysis is the length of time they have been in the U.S. If you look at that chart, you see that 40% have been there 15 years or less. For their age distribution, we see that the majority are between the ages of 40 and 79, with the mi minority, 18%, being in their 20s and 30s, and 12% being 80 years of age or older. This is a very different age distribution than the U.S. born sisters who are primarily older. So this is, again, as part of our analysis, a very important piece to consider. When we asked them to self-identify to tell us what best describes their primary ethnicity or cultural background. 35% said Asian or Pacific Islander. 33% said they were European or Canadian or Australian. 21% said Latin American or Mexican. And 11% said African or Afro-Caribbean. We then asked them 
about their proficiency in English. Do they feel that they comprehend, speak, and write English fluently? Now, in our interviews, many, many said a major concern is language. So, they self-identified again, and you will see that about 90% of the European, Canadian, and Australian sisters say that they comprehend, speak, and write English fluently. Three quarters of the African and Afro-Caribbean sisters say the same. And about 57% of the Asians say the same. And half of the Latin American and Mexican sisters say that they are proficient in the English language. So differences relative to proficiency. Now the level of education is fascinating. When we asked them about their educational attainment, over half said that they have a graduate or a professional degree. 20% said they have a college or university undergraduate degree. 14% have some college courses but no degree. 11 have some secondary or less. And the 2% said they have trade or technical school education. So a wide range of levels of educational attainment. Their current ministry and the vast majority are in ministry. Again, another very large spread, a large range of ministerial responses. About one-fifth work either in a parish or a diocesan office or ministry or in a particular ethnic ministry, obviously with their own ethnic group. But we found a wide number of these sisters work with many other ethnic peoples and beyond. So one-fifth work in hospital or healthcare ministry. 15% in education or teaching. 14% a student at either a U.S. college or a school of theology. 13% are in congregational service or in formation ministry or in vocation ministry. For some of those sisters whom we interviewed, some are in newly planted congregations. So they are doing development work and fundraising as they begin their congregation's life in the United States. And for some of those sisters, they identified their ministry as evangelization. Nine percent are in social service ministry of many types. Five percent are contemplatives in monasteries. And one percent are in campus ministry. 
We then move to their concerns. When we asked them, they, and they would use the somewhat or the very much category here, what is their greatest concern? More than half said the ability to participate in the life of their congregation. And in interviews, many had very painful stories about feeling a separateness from their home congregation or sometimes from their home superior. Some talked about misunderstandings that arise, the distance they felt. That relates to the second big finding, a sense of belonging, trying to belong to their home congregation while at the same time trying to move into religious life in the U.S. and U.S. culture. And they talked about the multiple cultures, the culture of the nation, the culture of the church, the culture of religious life, and then the culture of their ministry workplace. So they were constantly balancing the multiple cultures in which they had to navigate every day and yearning for a sense of belonging in all of those places, but particularly a connection to other women religious in the United States, a yearning for a deeper bondedness with, with women religious of many congregations in their local area and beyond. Many talked about tiredness, overwork, about a third felt anxiety or stress. About a fifth were dealing with chronic illness, uh, a serious chronic illness. Another fifth dealing with weight issues, others with a sense of loneliness or isolation, with depression, and a small percentage with alcohol or drug use. Now, we have much qualitative data to continue to analyze. But in large stroke, what did we hear? We would say we heard a yearning for social connection on many, many levels. And that social connection was often complicated by language difficulties. That came up over and over and over again. And many sisters said they were shocked by how difficult the English language is to learn. Social connection is also affected by cultural expectations. Many sisters were surprised by the amount of bureaucracy in the United States and by the bureaucracy in the church. So they were surprised by the red tape, by the rules, the regulations, issues about uh, ministry uh, since the sex abuse crisis. Some sisters said they would start to hug children or hug elderly people and they were told, don't hug them. And one sister said to us, how does one be a sister in the U.S.? I have to figure out, how does one minister? It's so different. One sister said, 
The first minute she arrived at a new ministry, she was told, we must give you a criminal background check. And she said, what is this? So constantly navigating the complexities of living and ministering. In community living, great effort to try to navigate differences in terms of, as Sister Carmen said, theologies, prayer styles, food. We heard about food all across the United States. Also about space. In some places, there are no big convents or mother houses in which to live. So getting used to apartment living, getting used to transportation, getting used to a different schedule and the energy that is demanded in doing all of that. The energy that is demanded in maintaining congregational involvement, the mutuality of, of reaching out to the home congregation and sometimes waiting to hear back from the home congregation and the hurt that can come from that. There were a variety of welcomes. In many places, sisters, U.S. born sisters, uh, lay people in parishes, pastors were very sensitive and very kind. In other places, not that way. So they gave advice on what would be helpful to welcoming new sisters. If those sisters came as a group, particularly with sisters from their own congregation, the entry was much easier because there was a sense of solidarity and companionship. When the sisters came as individuals, it was in some cases very isolating. Some sisters talked about how, as Pope Francis reminded the United States last year, we are a nation of immigrants, and our church was built by immigrants, and so they felt previous generations of immigrants really understood their situation. Others felt that some of those immigrants forgot what it was like to be an immigrant. The majority said that they are usually happy in the United States, that they have felt support, and we asked them the types of support that helped so that it can be replicated and so that it can break through that individualism that is part of the U.S. culture. They said that they appreciate and are enlivened by their ministries and that they have met uh, wonderful people, uh, both the people they are serving with and the people they are serving. While some need more supports in order to sustain their spiritual life and enhance their vocation as sisters, many have found uh, retreats, but many more say they wish they could get a retreat in their language. Uh, some have found spiritual directors, but others are looking for spiritual directors in their own language. Some feel that their spiritual life 
has been enhanced by being an overseas mission. Uh, so, for the most part, there are things we could do, but there are some things that are working, thank God. They want to put more energy, many of them who have been there for a while and have uh, developed some connections, they would like to put more energy now into building and sustaining relationships. Again, many said with U.S.-born sisters to understand further religious life in the U.S. and our mission. while also balancing the connection to the Institute at home. They talked at length about the diversity in prayer styles and in worship styles, the different kinds of parishes. They're amazed at the huge geographic expanse of the United States and uh, the different ecclesiologies and theologies They feel, many of them, that they are a bridge, particularly at this time of terrible anti-immigration uh, feelings and actions on the part of some in our very government. They feel that they can, that part of their mission is to bring about a deeper intercultural understanding within the U.S. church and within U.S. society. They feel that they can be a bridge between the sending and the receiving communities. And they ask that more work be done on acculturation for both senders and receivers. Now, we have some recommendations and I will be very interested to hear your thoughts as well on what you would recommend from your own experience. How many minutes left? 10, 15 minutes left. So we'll work our way through these. These come from the surveys and they come from the interviews. The first is a systematic response to the variety of needs of the most vulnerable sisters. So we can see there is a tremendous range in support systems for these sisters. It is a stereotype if we reduce international sisters down to one type. One of the gifts to the Catholic Church in the United States is this incredible array of gifts that they bring. They are a gift and they bring so many gifts. One slice of their reality is that some who are more vulnerable because or some who came alone or who are experiencing tremendous difficulties with the language, or they are in parts of the country, either huge urban areas or rural areas or suburban areas where they feel deep isolation, or there are difficulties in ministry misunderstandings with either the pastor or misunderstanding with the home superior. All of those vulnerabilities are taking a toll. And so how to think about multiple levels of support for our most vulnerable sisters. Secondly, one of the beauties that I have seen in my travels around the country 
and in my own communities when I have lived with international sisters, particularly in formation. It is often the oldest generation of sisters in the house who are the most loving and supportive and helpful, especially with the language. And so there is such a sense of generativity in the evening to see the older sisters helping the younger sisters with their school assignments, with helping to them to reflect on their day in ministry, then to see the older sisters receive from the younger sisters or from the newer sisters uh, the stories of the congregations from all over the world from which they come, to receive their insights about U.S. culture, about church, about religious life, to receive their energy, their joy. And so could we think about whole new systems and structures that would allow for that help relative to that level of language with connection to ESL programs, with professionals who are trained relative to speaking, writing, and comprehension, could there be a new way to think about supporting sisters relative to that need in their mission for language training, but then for the sustaining efforts to help them as they move further into the language and culture? Thirdly, levels of education. How to support sisters who are transitioning from ministries, one ministry to another, who need new kinds of certification, new kinds of language, other degrees, how to help sisters with lower levels of educational attainment attain their degrees, attain the training they need to enter into ministry. How to find the money that will help increase uh, levels of educational attainment for those who are called to ministries that require that. So many of them, and again, go back to what they said they need, language, and then mentoring. So many asked if there could be sisters from, uh, international sisters who had been there longer than they, or U.S.-born sisters who could accompany them as they navigate all of the challenging aspects of life in a new nation. One sister who would, who would take on the ministry of accompaniment, one sister that that new sister could check in with periodically, that it be systematized, that there be a structure of mentoring, that we call forth sisters who might not have even thought about that new ministry in their life or additional ministry in their life. Next, acculturation processes for the sending and receiving groups. So many sisters said to us, we could be doing, we as religious, could be doing a better job tapping into the experience of other congregations, of many other institutes and religious in the world to say, what works? What should we do? What should we know? Sometimes they felt they were just dropped in to a community or dropped into a parish. And that's when some of the misunderstandings about cultural difference in particular happened. So one sister said to me, we should call the Mary Noel missioners. They are missionaries. What do they know? Could they teach us what to do? 
what to be sensitive to, what have they learned. So a greater sharing, even the creation of a clearinghouse where as the migration patterns continue to shift all over the earth, as women and men religious move for the sake of mission, what could be established so we could all learn more about sending and receiving? Next, we are suggesting that clearer policies, more just policies be devised so that sisters who are sent for study or particular ministry or for certain periods of time to certain places, that there be understanding on both sides, the home superior and the sister, so that there is clarity and justice so that people, that there are not the misunderstandings that cause the hurts that we saw in some cases. We must start planning in our country for future housing and community life needs because the spaces will diminish in the years ahead. The big mother houses that have been so welcoming and so many of the sisters thanked uh, so many in the LCWR orders for their great hospitality in large convents and in mother houses. But as some of those close in the year ahead, years ahead, where will these sisters find rich and happy community life with access to the Eucharist, access to um, support, and how to do planning now, not just for the international sisters, but for the U.S. sisters who are called to uh, be with them in community as well. How to continue to build solidarity. As Pope Francis calls us to build solidarity on the local le level and on the global level. How do we put the needs of these sisters for solidarity in the wider mission of the following of Christ. How do we train sisters who come to our country and other countries to be people of interculturality? Many identify themselves as such already and they are constantly in that space where they are moving to build a more intercultural church and society, sometimes against great odds. But at the same time, how do they and all of us receive intracultural training? That is, issues within the particular ethnic or racial groups. Several of us reminded, several of them reminded us when we say Asian sisters, there are many cultures within Asia. And Vietnamese sisters are different from Indian sisters in some ways in terms of their culture. That's just one example. There are other intracultural issues. For instance, we saw in some cases some sisters express pain around the fact that they were having difficulty dealing with some international priests from their home country. And they felt that in some cases, some pastors were asking them to overwork. They were putting demands on the sisters in terms of labor seven days a week, morning, noon, and night. And those sisters said to us, he would never ask a US-born sister to work like that. So, to continue to tease apart the intracultural, the intercultural. Another aspect that we will be pursuing in the book is related to the sociology and the history 
that we are analyzing now. So for instance, my parents were Irish immigrants. On my father's side, the generation before he immigrated to the US, some of his aunts and uncles had immigrated from Ireland as well. Two of his aunts became Catholic sisters. So there are international sisters in my bloodline. So when those sisters immigrated almost 100 years ago, those international sisters to the US came from Ireland, Germany, Poland, Italy, primarily. They entered into their congregations, often to do the work within that congregation and to pretty much stay in service to that particular ethnic group. What we found today, as sisters come from Africa, Latin America, and Asia, some bring with them networks. Because of the internet, they are connected to home. For some of them, like the Vietnamese, for instance, before they even come to study in the US, they are meeting over the internet fellow Vietnamese sisters and priests who advised them on where they could find mass in Vietnamese, a spiritual director who speaks Vietnamese, etc., etc. So how do we further explore the new kinds of networks and the new systems that the new sisters are entering into? It's a very different model from 100 years ago when those international sisters helped build the church in different times. How are the new sisters building the church in these times? So finally, we are saying, when we look at all our data, these international sisters are hidden in plain sight. That is, Still, in some places in the US, we will go to a meeting and there'll be two or three Vietnamese over here. Another meeting, three or four Mexicans over there. Another meeting, one or two Nigerians over there. And when we look at the reality, we see that when we bring them together, they are a powerful force. They cross all kinds of boundaries. They are found in ministry in every part of the United States doing such wonderful work and being a new and renewing force for religious life and the church. So how to look at this in new ways and see the reality that's right before our eyes. Secondly, as I said before, and the book will reinforce this, there is not one story about international sisters. There are many, many stories. So we are asking all of us to look at our starting points, look at our stereotypes. What is the first thing we say when someone says, Look at those international sisters. Are we reducing their reality to a narrow, often uh, restrictive analysis? Something does, that does not allow us to see the largeness of God's action in this particular facet of our life. And finally, we would say that through the witness of their lives and ministries, they are building bridges and tearing down walls all across the great expanse of the United States of America. And they bring with them, as they do this, new perspectives, new energy, and the new life of the risen Christ in this Easter season.
So thank you very much for your attention. Benissimo. Sì. Allora, adesso ogni gruppo brevemente può fare delle domande o delle considerazioni. Grazie Lorenzo, vai. Si sente? Ok, va bene. Allora, eh, la nostra considerazione parte da un, apprezzia, un apprezzamento, da un'esperienza che ci sembra bella di integrazione di queste sorelle straniere negli Stati Uniti che vengono... Ok, e ci piace che sono chiamate sorelle internazionali e che sono quasi diventate dei, degli elementi di valore a, valutate come ponte addirittura culturale, questo ci piace. Ma ci manca l'altra parte della parte degli Stati Uniti, delle sorelle statunitense, come è vissuta l'integrazione? Sono veramente integrate da diventare veramente ponte oppure c'è ancora da fare? E vediamo che questo studio è molto importante e provocatorio per noi qui a Roma e ci piacerebbe che si possa fare su Roma visto le problematiche che ci sono e che negli Stati Uniti hanno già affrontato. Grazie. Grazie Lorenz. Vi, vi chiedo di alzare la mano se volete mh, intervenire. È bene che ogni gruppo possa restituire qualcosa a Suor Mary. Grazie. Grazie. Eh, noi eh, abbiamo eh, diciamo, ascoltato tutto, molto interessante, molto diverso, ma ci manca un po' eh, la, eh, diciamo, la domanda, il problema delle suore che sono venuti per esempio negli Stati Uniti, ma anche in, in Europa, penso che ci stanno, di cui nessuno ha la responsabilità. Che cosa eh, non, non è chiaro com è, come si presenta di preciso questo problema e che, co che cosa possiamo pensare di questo? Ti chiedo gentilmente di presentarti, anche un modo per ah. conoscerci, grazie. Sono Suor Marjolaine e sono la segretaria generale del UCESM. La conferenza dei religiosi e delle religiose dell'Europa e mi chiedono anche tecnicamente di potervi alzare fisicamente perché si sente meglio. I'm Matthew uh, from the Claditians. Um, you were speaking of the necessity to belong and to connect and there is also the modern gadgets of uh, being connected to one's own country and therefore one can get closed up also. So how to balance the connection and the necessary disconnection or inculturation and the interculturality? Thank you. Thank you. Sor Tiziana. <coughs> Ecco, grazie della presentazione e della cura. Eh, personalmente ho vissuto negli Stati Uniti, per cui mi sono sentita fotografata da questa um, presentazione. Una domanda che veniva è um, se in questa um, indagine avete avuto modo di um, eh, toccare con mano il fenomeno di coloro che eh, a un certo punto escono dagli istituti e rimangono negli Stati Uniti eh, probabilmente insomma, senza documenti o senza una eh, copertura. E anche un'altra domanda di interesse insomma, è, è quelle che non escono dall'istituto ma non, non ce la fanno 
a tornare nei loro paesi di origine quando fossero venute negli Stati Uniti per studi o la, la loro formazione. Come fare ecco, ad accompagnarle? Grazie. Grazie, Sor Tiziana. Falta un poco la voce spagnola. Sorry, it's not Spanish. Spanish. Okay, now don't worry. <laughs> so welcome. Yeah. Um, my question has to do with the definition of um, the U.S. sisters. How was that defined? What categories were taken into consideration um, so as to look at how the relationship possibly could be built over time? Can you introduce yourself? Oh, I'm Sister Mary Therese. I represent uh, Dominican Sisters International. It's a grouping of Dominican Sisters worldwide. Thank you. Aquí ahora la voz española. Soledad Claretiana, en, en la mesa comentábamos si el, el research, la investigación, ha estado trabajando con las hermanas individualmente o ha habido algún contacto con las responsables de esas congregaciones que envían a las hermanas o de qué forma las comunidades de la propia congregación acogen, favorecen, ayudan a la integración o cómo pueden hacerlo. Gracias. Muchas gracias. Mando contributi. Ah, sì. qualche minuto per i gruppi che non hanno ancora, se desiderano, con molta libertà. Eh, Sor Luigina, eh, missionaria comboniana della UIC. La nostra preoccupazione anche era riguardo alle preparazioni professionali, che sono un elemento essenziale poi per eh, l'integrazione. Questo movimento da, da paesi all'altro, da un continente all'altro, le preparazioni dove avvengono? Avvengono negli USA? Avvengono nei paesi di origine? Sono facilmente compatibili, riconosciuti? Grazie. Grazie, Sor Luigina. There is so much here. So thank you very much for your comments and questions. And I will respond as best I can. I think that there are many tasks before us. So on one level, the task of preparing sisters in receiving countries, sisters in the local communities, sisters in the ministries, sisters in leadership. We heard some stories of some good practices. But you are right when you say we need a place for best practices so that we do not keep reinventing the wheel. That is why I said earlier, one sister said, what about Mary Knoll? What about the missionary institutes? What have they learned? Do they have handbooks? Do they have courses? What about those dioceses that have vicars of religious who have done a lot of work in this area. Then the question is, whose responsibility is that to pull that, those materials together to create that clearinghouse? So I would say to you who are in leadership to think about that as one piece of this. Another dimension is the preparation of leaders in the sending countries. How do we bring together those materials that would help those sisters for the magnitude of what this involves? And because we heard so many uh, stories of difficulty, it is clear that that is a need as well. So the preparation of the senders and the receivers, and then the, the 
and the search for the best practices and then it all being pulled together by people um, in roles which would allow them to do this and for them to seek the resources they would need to do this. It is clear, and you are agreeing with us, that that is a fundamental need. Secondly, how to even lift this up as a category? One of you asked, how did we define U.S. sisters? So we would say, for the purposes of this study, a U.S. sister is one born in the U.S. However, as U.S. sisters, we are also international sisters. So we cannot go there for this study. <laughs> and so how do we prepare those sisters in all of our countries, in their home countries, to think of themselves on two levels? that they are of their homeland and they have got to be prepared to receive international sisters, but on another level, they are part of what is being described now as the global sisterhood, that we are all in mission together to the world. So the continued reflection we need on these categories, these definitions, these concepts we are trying to illuminate for the sake of mission and solidarity. Next, the question about the vulnerable sisters. Because it was a scientific project. We had to use methods so that we could attain our sample. If it were not scientific, I could go to New York City, walk the streets, ask people to help me find some sisters. I would find exactly what you said, a few, who had left their institute, a few who um, were in great difficulty. And your questions about who is ministering to them, what is our obligation, how can we respond, those are very, very important questions. But we did not do uh, the investigation because America is so huge. We could not go to every city and every town and to do the kind of investigation to find the people who had fallen through the cracks, who would not be on lists from the leaders or the vicars. But those sisters exist. And my question is, how do we create the sensitivity that should be in us to all vulnerable women, including our own sisters and former sisters, and respond to those needs? While at the same time, now hear me out on this, please, at the same time, keeping the big picture of the vast array of giftedness in this population. So I will be very honest with you. When I have talked to some people in the US and I have said we have done this study, their starting point is always, oh, a sister who left or a sister who um, experienced a great, uh, was in great difficulty, or a sister who was uh, exploited in a particular way. But they do not talk about all the other sisters and the many contributions they are also making. So my point is, 
that we all must be careful in lifting up the whole truth or this story will be reduced to just one story while it is in reality many, many stories. So I hope you understand that I am saying we must, as we suggested, be extremely sensitive and figure out how to respond to those who are vulnerable, while at the same time building new systems and structures so that we can meet and learn from and work with and live with these new sisters whom God is sending us to so many countries of the world. In particular in the US, we have 1,200 women in formation. Thank God. They will be the peers to some of these international sisters. That is one small example. How do we build relationships and help them build relationships for the future of religious life. They will be together. And it will be a mutuality. And a learning across the boundaries. And a sisterhood across the boundaries. And I talked earlier about the cross-generational love and joy I have seen of the older sisters helping the younger with their English in particular. And the older sister so engaged and receiving, and the younger sister so engaged and receiving. So I am speaking on the level of the big picture. And I know we all have to go home now and make it real within our own circumstances. The question posed about the balance between connection and disconnection for the sake of enculturation. That's the universal question, and that's the struggle we saw in some of these data. So what do we know already? What, from your own institutes, your own life experiences, do we know about the support systems that are now needed for them to find that balance in in this anti-immigrant uh, place that many of them are right now. And that is not the US, not, all, not the US alone, but also Europe. The big question you ask about integration. Again, I would say, what do we know and how can we share what we know? This seems to be the challenge of this time. If I had to boil down all the data, it is about acculturation for all of us. We are being called beyond the boundaries in which we find ourselves. And the beauty of our life is that we can share it with others and learn from others in our way of life for the sake of what is clearly the new calling, the new life, and the new energy of a renewed religious life in my home country, but in other countries of the world as well. So I will conclude with that, and you might say she did not answer my question, but I am on the level right now of, of um, the wider analysis. And so when you will read the book, you will see more of the specifics. We will be uh, especially working on the part about the systems and structures and networks that we have come across in the US, which we did not even know existed. And that will be the last part of the book, and all of us can share that together. So thank you very much. <laughs>